So I think we can now uh, get going. All right, I'll just introduce myself again. I'm Sarah Vaya. I'm a professor at University of Maryland. And today we're talking about two really important climate actions, uh, uh, cutting food waste and shifting towards a plant-based diet. Um, I'll actually be talking about the diet shift first, um, and then we'll we'll take on food waste second. So um, food waste and diets are the two biggest impact climate solutions after um, shifting production of electricity from fossil fuels to renewables. And this picture is from um, the uh, uh, Project Drawdown from their um, publication called Drawdown Review. If this was published in um, 2020. It's an update of some of their original ideas. It's really worth taking a look at. And the way they deal with climate solutions is they divide them into reduced sources of greenhouse gases and increased sinks of greenhouse gases. So this is their figure for um, all the sources that can be reduced and should be reduced, sources of greenhouse gases. And uh, the numbers below each one um, basically indicate the uh, magnitude of the effect in gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalents um, uh, reduced. So we, we have already talked about shifting the production of electricity from fossil fuels to renewables. Um, I talked about that in the in the first webinar this year. This is the third webinar. Um, and so what you can see is the size of the circle, where's my mouse? The size of the circle um, indicates the size of the impact, okay? So this is a big impact and the you know, width of this uh, lighter border indicates the difference between the low estimate and the high estimate, okay? So the second biggest set of impacts falls under food, agriculture, and land use. And it's basically food waste and diets, what we're talking about today. So I took this one circle and um, broke it up into its components, um, reduce food waste. Um, uh, oh, this is the impact between 2020 and 2050. Yeah, thank you. Um, and um, reducing food waste has a bigger impact than um, shifting to a plant-rich a plant -rich diet, but the two together have a huge impact. So reducing food waste, shifting to a plant-rich diet. Um, and I just wanted to make sure you notice the change in scale. This didn't all, all of a sudden become a more of an impact than it is over here. It's just that I, sh I shifted the scale. Okay. Um, Around noon, this um, <laughs> graphic hit my um, email inbox from Project Drawdown. And I really wanted to include it because I um, it, it puts, again, these actions, reducing food waste and shifting to a plant-rich diet, it puts them into a context of all the other sort of individual actions. Um, now, food waste isn't just an individual action, but... Uh, uh, leaving that there for a second. So individual and household actions can produce between 25% and 30% of the emissions reductions we need to avoid exceeding that 1.5 degree global temperature increase point, which is, you know, the, the, we don't want to go beyond that, although it seems inevitable now that we're at least going to overshoot it, um, but that's the goal. Um, and again, I just want to reiterate this. This this is from Project Drawdown. Um, twenty five to thirty five, uh, twenty five to thirty percent of the of the reductions we need to keep below one point five are in our hands. And so I think that's um, really well worth thinking about. So um, they've divided these impacts into food, waste, travel, and energy. Um, and you can see just two actions here account for almost half of the emissions reductions that 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 are in our hands okay so this, these have two really big impacts um our waste recycling pla reducing plastic this doesn't mean getting you know having the fossil fuel companies stop making plastic this means just don't don't use as much plastic that's why there's not such a huge effect composting recycling paper um travel uh again almost three percent of what we need 
our energy, 8% of what we need. This is again, just what we do in our homes. Okay. Cause we know that switching over to renewable energy is, uh, is a, you know, it has a big impact. Anyway, we're going to talk about these two things for the next um, 50 minutes or so. Okay. Let's start out talking about diet. Um, I wanted to show this <laughs> because it puts our discussion into a context. I want to discuss the recommendations, the health recommendations for your diet or one's diet uh, versus what people actually eat. Now, um, this is not the USDA pyramid. The USDA has mucked around with their pyramid. And um, in my view, it is almost completely useless at this point. Um, uh, this is actually... Uh, represents what um, teenagers in Belgium should eat and what they do eat, but it's very close to the same sorts of issues that we have. Um, physical activities at the bottom, everybody should be doing physical activity, drinking water and sugar-free drinks, um, uh, sort of starchy um, uh, foods, potatoes, rice, and pasta, breads and cereal, vegetables, um, dairy, meat, fish, and eggs, uh, uh, spreadable and cooking fat, and then all the stuff, <laughs> processed food, junk foods, um, things that really do not have very much nutrition. So it within the boundaries is where you're supposed to be. But there's two categories where uh, the Belgian teenagers and also pretty much U.S. adults are really exceeding the recommendations. The first one is meat, fish, and eggs. I'm not sure what substitutes is, but meat, fish, and eggs, mostly meat, 31% more than the recommendations. In the US, it's much more than that, exceeding the recommendations. And I'll, um, I will show you that later. Um, and then all the junk food we eat, all the nutrient poor foods, the, you know, the chips, the snack foods, et cetera, 39% of total daily in intake is supposed to be this little amount. Okay. So, uh, and of course, nobody's getting enough physical exercise. So this kind of puts it into a little bit of a context. Um, our food choices have a big impact on carbon emissions. And um, I know some of you have seen this picture before. There are various versions of this showing the um, uh, carbon dioxide equivalents. A CO2E is... Um, putting methane and nitrous oxide, the other two other hugely important greenhouse gases, on the same scale of activity as carbon dioxide. So that's carbon dioxide equivalents. Um, and um, this, I want you to notice that this is per kilogram of consumed food. And for those of you who forget what a kilogram is, it's 2.2 pounds. So um, uh, lamb and beef are the, you know, the big, you know, high areas here. And um, uh, the next is cheese. But I just want you to consider most people don't eat the same amount of cheese that they would eat of beef and lamb, right? A serving of beef and lamb is four to eight or even more ounces. A serving of cheese is maybe just an ounce or two. So pork, farm salmon, turkey. So poultry is down here. Okay. And the ruminant um, uh, the ruminant um, animals are up here because they're burping out all that methane. The green um, part of the bar is what happens on the farm and the orange part of the bar is what happens after the farm processing and whatnot. So food overall is 13% of US greenhouse gas emissions. And I just wanted to show you this because you can see there's really two big parts of the food emissions. Um, there's direct nitrous oxide, okay, and um, and that that's five point six of you know, five point six percent. So this adds up to thirteen, and that is mostly caused by the application of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, which um, is transformed by microbes when it hits the soil um, into uh, nitrate, which is sol soluble, and it goes into the water and um, nitrous oxide, which is a gas, 380 times more potent than um, carbon dioxide. So this is from crops, okay? And remember, 60 to 70% of crops are grown to feed animals. So uh, the direct methane, beef and sheep. So these are the burps. And um, those two sectors represent pretty much all of the, or most of the food emissions. Okay, 
Um, so let's talk about how much meat Americans eat, since that is a very high, you know, greenhouse gas causing food. Um, in 2020, the per capita consumption of all meats was around 175 pounds a year. Um, this is a graphic from an article in the Guardian newspaper, but they got the data from the USDA. And um, I've put the um, uh, the kinds of meats in uh, order and the same colors as they are over here. Um, so the average American eats 69 pounds of chicken a, um, a year. That's 21 ounces of chicken a week. And that comes out to, I did a little homework on, you know, <laughs> what's an average chicken breast and how much is a chicken nugget weigh? That comes out to, you know, being able to eat three chicken breasts and 18 chicken nuggets a week. So that's sort of the chicken allotment. Of course, you can divide it up among the foods differently, but uh, this gives you an idea. 56 pounds of beef on average per American per year. That's uh, over a pound a week. Um, that's one five ounce steak, which I think in steak terms would be considered a pretty small steak and three quarter pounders that adds up to 17 um, or yeah, 17. Um, and then 49 pounds of pork, 15 ounces a week, almost a pound. That's 12 sausage links and one four, four ounce pork chop. So if you look at all these, you know, uh, entries, this is enough meat for someone who's eating this at 175 pounds almost a year, this is enough meat to have meat at pretty much every meal, okay? Three times a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, and uh, so, uh, well, that's quite a bit of meat. All right, I want to talk a little bit about the resources required to produce not just meat, but some of the other um, foods that we that we eat. This is from a an article in um, Proceedings of the National Academy, and um, what they've done is they've uh, they've decided to focus on five different types of food: dairy, beef, poultry, pork, and eggs. And they have looked at how much land does it take um, to uh, sort of grow enough <laughs> to get a thousand um, calories of any of these kinds of food how much irrigation water is required, what, how much greenhouse gases are emitted, how much nitrogen goes into the soil. This is the stuff that turns into nitrous oxide. And what fraction of the average US diet um, um, does each one of these types of food make up, okay? So if we um, just look down here, you can see that the beef line is pretty much bigger than all the other lines, except for uh, part of the diet larger than all the other lines. When you look at how much land beef takes, I want you to notice that these little hatch marks, when you look at a graph and there's these little hatch marks like that, it means that this is really way off the scale. So if you look at the scale here, this is like 20 um, meters square to produce a thousand calories. It takes 147 um, meters square to produce a thousand calories of beef. Um, only about 40% oh, of the same amount to produce dairy. This is uh, the, the hatched is pasture for beef or dairy. Um, and you can see it doesn't, you know, it doesn't take, did I say 40%? No, this is um, like eight, this is 147. So forget I said 40%, that was wrong. See, that's why these little hatch marks are deceiving. Um, what these folks have done is they've indicated these resources relative to three staple plants, potatoes, pea, rice, R, or W, wheat. And so if you look at the land required to you know, grow potatoes, rice, or wheat, it's basically less than that required to grow any of these other kinds of food. Um, so dairy is um, higher than the rest, but it's way lower than beef cattle, okay? Um, poultry, pork, and eggs are down here. Irrigation water. Here's how much rice takes a lot of water. Okay, um, potatoes and wheat. Uh, I think they irrigate potatoes. Again, we've got the little hatch mark here for beef. Um, this is 1.6, whereas the the next highest one is less than 0.2. Okay, so this is. It's like if this was drawn to scale. This one would be way over here off the screen. This one would be, you know, over here. But so they crammed it onto one and they um, and they just use these hatch marks and tell us that actually it's bigger than all the rest by a lot. 
I think that's kind of confusing, but hopefully I've explained it in a way that you get it. Um, so beef uses a lot of land, a lot of water, okay, much more than the rest. Um, it emits more greenhouse gases than the rest of the foods. It is responsible for the application of much more fertilizer than the rest. This is 60. This is 176, okay? So you can see it's three times the maximum here. It's um, more than probably four times the um, amount of nitrogen used for pork. Um, and again, this is from the crops grow to, grown to feed the animals. Now, percent of calories in mean U.S. diet. Dairy is about 12%. Um, but has a much smaller footprint in all respects than beef. Um, beef is 7%, um, poultry is 6%, pork is 4%, eggs 1%, okay? So in the U.S. diet, beef is only 7% of the calories, and I'll talk about protein in just another in a, another minute, but it has an outside impact, outsized impact on the resources required, land, water, um, uh, and greenhouse gas emissions and, and um, nitrogen. This pollutes the water as well as polluting the air. So, okay, there we have it. This is from a paper in uh, 2018 in Science Magazine. It puts beef into an environmental context. Um, I'll just read right from their figure. More than 80% of farmland is used for livestock, but it produces just 18% of food calories and 37% of protein. Um, so this is all livestock, not just beef. Uh, so the contribution of farmed animal products as a percent of all food, okay, so calories 18%, protein 37, this is what we already talked about, land use 83, um, more than half of the almost, you know, 60% of the greenhouse gas emissions from food come from um, farmed animal products more than half of the water pollution, more than half of the air pollution, and around a third of the fresh water um, withdrawals are used for farmed animal products. So these kinds of foods are um, having a much bigger impact for the calories, the protein, et cetera, that they're providing for the diet than pretty much any of the other foods. Um, this is from a, um, uh, uh, a report from all of these international agencies, the State of Food Security and Nutrition in, in 2020, and it shows the current diet. This is greenhouse gas emissions from the current diet, and it breaks down the uh, foods in the current diet. Um, this is milk, dark blue. This is uh, beef and lamb, okay? And then we have uh, poultry and eggs up here. Um, I think this is pork, fruits and vegetables, sugar and oils, et cetera. So, and then there are four alternative diets. The Mediterranean diet, which allows meat, but is much lower on meat than, um, than the current American diet. Um, a diet that is vegetarian, but adds fish, um, a standard vegetarian diet, and then a vegan diet, which doesn't allow any, you know, um, any uh, milk or eggs or anything. So, um, According to this report, adopting any of these four alternative diets would significantly re reduce uh, global greenhouse gas emissions in 2030. So that's what this scale is, greenhouse gas emissions. The most for the current diet, next most for Mediterranean, and then it goes down from there. But you can see that you, you know, even if adopting a vegetarian diet with fish or even a little bit more meat, is appreciably better than for greenhouse gas emissions than the current diet. I wanna make one comment about the Mediterranean diet, which does allow meat. I just read a, a, a paper about this that um, compared to these other um, healthier diets, this is a healthy diet. Compared to these though, um, more land use is required and um, uh, it's not, it, it's sort of hard on biodiversity. Um, much harder than these. So I'm going to talk about the impact of food on biodiversity next week, uh, but I'll just sort of tangentially go there right now. All right. Um, there are a lot of impacts of the average American diet other than greenhouse gas emissions. And so I, I made this kind of complicated picture to sum up all of the different impacts in four areas, health, equity, sustainability, and biodiversity. I'm gonna to focus today on the impacts of the diet on health. As I said, I'm gonna talk about these next time. 
and I'm, I, you know, this is really important because the food system is incredibly inequitable, but I don't have time to talk about it right now. So um, what I'll do is I'll focus on the health impacts and touch on um, the fact that there are you know, increasing number of pandemics, increasing pathogens, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, those are an impact of diet plus antibiotic resistance. So let's get going on that. Um, impacts of the American diet on health not good. <laughs> okay, here's a sort of caricature of the American diet, pretty much um, uh, not very healthy. But I really like this because it's a sort of a play on the USDA, you know, plate that you're supposed to eat. You got you got your Fruit Loops. <laughs> and then I don't know, you got candy or maybe something else here. Here's some more candy and brownies and something. So this is a, you know, facetious, but still the American diet is not very healthy. And that's reflected in the increase in obesity over the years. This stops in 2018. I think we're up here at like over, over 48, 49% of people are considered obese and severely obese, almost you know 10% of people. Um, this is a direct impact of not just the food choices, but also eating more calories than are required. Um, so the diet's high in fat, it's high in meat, and it's high in sugar. Sugar. Sugar is also impacting our health in a bad way. Um, uh, uh, corn sweetener um, is used in pop, soda pop, and um, that's been on the rise. Again, this ends in 2002. I, I apologize for that. Um, but total sweeteners is sort of gently rising, and I think it's continuing to rise up as we get you know closer to the present. And you can see that starting in the late 1950s and ending in 2015, diabetes is practically rising, you know, exponentially, okay, because of the consumption of too much sugar. So obesity, diabetes, we know that those are uh, very bad health impacts, okay, people who have, uh, have these conditions are, are not very healthy. And it's a big drain on the health system as well. Um, so then let's talk about cancer and heart disease. The risk for colorectal cancer um, increases as you eat more processed meat, okay? So um, uh, this is less than 10 grams per day up to 80 grams a day, okay? So maybe a small impact, but we do know that processed meat like um, uh what am I thinking? Pepperoni and um, um, other sausage, you know, processed sausages, um, stuff like that are, are, have got sodium nitrite and other stuff in there. Cardiovascular disease also increases with the uh, processed meat intake, but it also increases with obesity. So we know that the diet that the average American is eating is not very healthy. Okay, now then there's a whole other array of health impacts. Um, uh, I'll talk about sort of the increased likelihood of, of pandemics from um, uh, pathogens crossing over from wild animals into direct, either directly into people or into livestock and then into people, okay? And this is happening because um, you know, population is growing and um, we are um, uh, increasing the overlap between humans and wild animals and between our livestock and wild animals. And so there's an opportunity for sort of crosstalk of the viruses and other pathogens. So that's um, a really big risk actually for us. Um, then there's foodborne illness. Uh, never very much fun, um, but salmonella is a huge impact in um, in meat, um, in chickens, in eggs, et cetera. And this is from an article in The Guardian. Here's the link. You'll be able to go see it for yourself when you get the slide handout. Um, the USDA rules say up to 15% of processed chickens can test positive for salmonella, which I think is kind of too much, but whatever. Um, but 10% of all processors in the US exceed that amount. I don't know how they get away with that, but there it is. And salmonella causes uh, one and a third million U.S. illnesses a year. And I don't think I've ever had it, but I have heard it's not very much fun. Food poisoning, basically. Um, 
food safety, there's another little clip about food safety down here. Um, a few years ago, we had the big romaine recall. Some of you may remember that. And um, finally, the FDA uh, came across with the piece of information that um, a cattle feedlot was uh, the water from the feedlot and the manure was draining down into irrigation ditches and then being used to irrigate uh, romaine. Well, <laughs> you can rinse off your romaine under the tap, but there is nothing that is going to remove bacteria from romaine or other lettuce or you know strawberries or stuff like that. And so that's a major breach of um, food safety right there. Um, and then there's antibiotic resistance. Antibiotic resistance is a really increasing thing and it's a really scary thing because um, I think most of us are used to either for ourselves or our children, if we get a bacterial infection, we can get an antibiotic prescribed and then a few days we feel better, we take the whole course and it's gone. Well, when we have antibiotic resistance, then you take the medicine and the bacteria don't die. Um, because they have evolved resistance to the drug. Um, how does that happen? Over prescription of antibiotics for, you know, in the doctor office for viral diseases, okay? For example, antibiotics do not help you if you have COVID, if you have the flu, because antibiotics work on bacteria and, you know, those are viral diseases. Um, uh, and the other big contributor to antibiotic resistance is antibiotic use in livestock. So antibiotic um, uh, use in animals has greatly increased antibiotic resistance. And it's really sort of frustrating because the livestock industry says, well, it's because the doctors are prescribing too much. And the doctors say, it's because the livestock people are prescribing too much. Well, everybody's prescribing too much, but my opinion, we really should not use antibiotics, uh, human antibiotics in animals. They also use human antibiotics on fruit trees to get rid of a bacterial disease of fruit, which does not make sense to me because once uh, important bacteria like Shigella, okay, it's an intestinal bacteria. And you can see once it starts to evolve resistance, it goes very fast, okay? And then people who wind up with a um, you know, Shigella um, infection, well, there, this, this is only at 5% right now, but you know what happens with exponential growth. And then, you know, you can't, you can't cure it. Um, resistance to vancomycin has, you know, really dramatically risen. It's only up to, this is 2001, um, but it looks like maybe it's leveling off. I think vancomycin is in the danger zone um, now. I wasn't able to find anything, you know, rapidly that was any, um, went any farther. But again, if we have you know, um, antibiotics that are commonly used in intensive care units that evolve in, uh, antibiotic resistance and stop working, then we're you know, in trouble. Okay, um, I'll just tell you a little uh, story about my mom. My mom was born in 1920 and she apparently had scarlet fever when she was a girl. And my kids both developed scar scarlet fever when they were little kids, but they got antibiotics. Well, my mom didn't get antibiotics because you know, it was probably like 1925 or 1930. And she said she was sick for months with this. And that is what happens when we don't have antibiotics at work. So antibiotic resistance, a big problem. All right, now the health costs that are you know incurred from the impacts of our diet are huge, okay? So this is again, this is for, you know, uh, for uh, the world, but um, uh, across the world, it costs about $1.3 trillion a year in health costs, okay? Well, it projected for 2030, $1.3 trillion. This is a lot of money. Um, and this is again, adoption of any of these other diets um, would save, a basket of money. Okay, so here's the, this is $1.3 billion. Direct is, this is the actual cost of being sick, the medical, et cetera, et cetera. Indirect is loss of wages, the amount of cost to have somebody come and take care of you and other stuff like that. So, but these are total health costs. If you adopted these other diets, hey, health costs would be dramatically reduced. And we could probably, uh, this is per year, okay, $1.3 billion per year. We could 
probably find a lot of really useful things to do with that 1.3 or maybe you know 1.1 1. 1. $1 billion dollars we could spend that on all the other stuff we have to do to try to solve the climate crisis so again we could improve our health and reduce the health costs all right now what does a healthy and sustainable diet look like well the lancet commission lancet is a very prestigious medical journal and medical group in the uk and they commissioned this eat lancet commission they set this up in 2019 to study what a healthy and sustainable diet would look like so not just healthy and not just sustainable but both and they call this the planetary diet so here's a, a diagram of uh, this circle is how much you can eat on each food group to be in the healthy and sustainable diets. So this is like a little cartoon because there's no units on here. But the average US diet, it, it, you can see, is exceeding those healthy and sustainable limits by a ton, beef um, 638%, that's 6.3 times as much as is allowed in the healthy and sustainable diet. 171% um, of potatoes, mostly French fries, 268% um, of eggs, 234% of chicken, and um, one and a half times about as much dairy as is consistent with healthy and sustainable. Now, what about these other food groups? Well, Americans eat a little fish, not as much as they could in a healthy and sustainable diet. Americans do not eat very many veggies. They love French fries. French fry is not a vegetable. Um, they're not very good on eating veggies. They could eat, you know, they only eat half as much as they could on a sustainable diet. Fruit, ditto, okay? But then it comes down here to these other food groups. They're almost invisible, okay? Americans eat so little of them. Legumes, whole grain, and nuts, okay? And that's really sort of, to me, fairly shocking. Especially, well, I don't know. I guess most people don't ever eat any of that stuff. But they could eat a lot more and it would be really a lot healthy for it. So if people adopted the planetary diet, that would reduce diabetes, cancer, and heart disease, like I showed you on the first slide, the first slide of this part. It would reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It would boost water quality because there's a lot of water pollution from the fertilizer and from the manure, et cetera. And it would free up land for natural climate solutions. That is um, using trees and grasslands to um, uh, store carbon either in the wood of trees or in the soil. Um, and um, right now we use all this land to grow feed for animals, you know, 60 to 70% of all cropland. Um, and we could be, you know, reforesting the areas that used to be forested and putting natural grasslands back on the other areas. And I'll talk about that next time when I talk about um, climate and biodiversity solutions that coincide. Okay. So if we could adopt this diet or even just get close, right? Every little bit helps. You don't have to immediately adopt this diet. You could, you know, say, hey, okay, maybe I'm eating six times as much beef, but what if I just reduce it a little bit? Then I'm down here. And then the next, you know, unit of time, month, year, then you're down here, right? So you can do it gradually. You don't have to do it all at once. And I think that's the thing I really want to, mention. What's in the planetary diet? Um, it, it, you can get really complicated and talk about how much of this and that you can have, but here's the sort of plate <laughs> of uh, what your, your average plate of food should look like. Half vegetables, um, another 20% of whole grains, a little bit of dairy food, a little bit of animal protein, um, uh, a lot of plant protein. So all the protein is broken down here, legumes and nuts. Um, people often stay away from nuts because they're worried about how much fat they have, but the fat that's in nuts is it's really so-called good fat because it's, um, geez, what am I, uh, polyunsaturated. It's good fat, not like the saturated fat in animals. And this is unsaturated plant oils. Okay. So, um, plus they recommend not eating more than 2000 calories a day, basically eating less overall, which is going to be better for your health and better for the environment. So, Limited intake on the planetary diet of red meat and starchy vegetables, especially when fried. Um, optional foods means you can eat, eat some of this, you know, don't make it your mainstay, eggs, poultry, and dairy foods. Emphasized foods, fish, vegetables, fruit, legumes, whole grains, and nuts. Fish is a little bit of a problem because sometimes, um, uh, especially growing um, uh, 
farmed fish uses a, a like a lot of soy meal and other stuff. We'll talk about that next week. Okay, so that's uh, sort of the the diet to emphasize these foods, um, have some of these foods, and then really try to ratchet these foods down. Okay, now. I realize it can be hard to change the diet. Um, there's a lot of barriers. Sometimes, you know, the dishes are unfamiliar. If people haven't had a lot of sort of plant-based meals, they, you know, they're not used to it. People who are used to, you know, meat and potato and, you know, um, frozen broccoli or something uh, on the plate, it's going to be a an adjustment to change to something which is more plant-based. Um, so there's different tastes. Here's this, you know, kid doesn't like it. Well, okay, sorry. Um, cultural traditions, sometimes, you know, the meats are important in different cultural traditions. Some people don't feel they have the skill to cook uh, vegetarian foods or, or plant-based foods. Um, a lot of people have, a, have some worries. They worry it's going to take more time. I mean, people are always uh, stretched for time. And there are solutions to that. Cook a lot you know, make a soup, make a casserole, and then eat leftovers. Um, they are concerned it will be less healthy. They think they won't get enough protein if they um, don't eat meat, as if they want to look like this. Well, you can look like this by eating a plant-based diet. This is really demonstrably false. They are worried that it will cost more, and um, uh, fresh vegetables do cost more, but frozen vegetables often don't. And um, I'll talk to you about food waste, which is reducing food waste is the easiest way to save money on your food bill right there. Um, and uh, I already talked about they're worried that it won't have as much protein, which is false. Then there's a sort of a social stigma, like and I'm going to say a real sexist thing right now, like real men don't eat, you know, lentils, <laughs> something like, you know, some absurd statement like that. Um, it's like, okay, I want to go out and cook on the grill. Okay, well, you can cook things on the grill that are plant-based. Um, and some, there are a lot of people have limited access to fresh food, but frozen vegetables are just as healthy. Canned vegetables are, are just as healthy. Um, it would be useful for you to think, you know, uh, at some point, which of these kinds of things bother you or your family? Can you, can you address them in ways that might work for your family? Um, how can we move towards a healthier and more sustainable diet? So, uh, I've talked a lot about attitude, how important attitude is. I think attitude is really important in this because if you sort of start out thinking, oh my goodness, I got to change my diet. I got to get rid of the, you know, my ding dongs and seven up. That was the ding dongs and seven up was the preferred lunch of my postdoc advisor. I don't know how he ever got to be 35 really, but um, I don't want to have to give up all that stuff, you know, kind of eh, a really negative attitude. It's going to be very hard to make any changes. If you can get yourself to be, you know, momentarily curious about it, well, hey, you know, what would this be like? Could I do this? Then it's a lot easier. And the thing about attitude is, if you can just get started, once you have even minor success, then it's positive feedback of happiness and you just can keep going, going, going. So I, I you know, thought, I would suggest that, you know, you might start out just thinking, cultivating an open and curious attitude, um, even if you have to force yourself and review for yourself, why is it worthwhile to change my diet? Well, there's health, there's the climate, there's the, you know, water pollution, et cetera. This is worth doing. Okay, this is a sort of for the common good, and it's also for my personal good. Then if you have kids at home or you have a spouse, pull the family into it. Get them to help. Talk to your kids about how useful it is. Talk to your spouse about health, et cetera. And then I suggest some, you know, some sort of uh, tried and true things. Start with small changes, but sort of keep yourself moving along, progressively increasing goals. Start simple with recipes that have just a few ingredients. I looked up vegetarian foods to get some pictures. <laughs> I always see pictures like this. A lot of, you know, I, I have the New York Times um, recipes and a lot of them have like 98 ingredients. I look at this and I go, there is no possible way I'm ever going to have all this stuff, uh, three sauteed zucchini pieces, you know, two, uh, cherry tomatoes, just like, forget it. I'm not going to ever have that. So too complicated for me. However, there are a lot of really good uh, dishes and a lot of them have pasta in them. And I'm going to get to pasta in just a second. Um, uh, and they're really easy to whip up. 
Okay, and there's a lot of places on the net you can find um, easy recipes like that. Just a few ingredients that you can saute or just you know cook in a short order. And then keep track of your progress. <laughs> just try out maybe one, one night a week or, or, um, or then move to a couple nights a week. Um, so the glide path to a plant-based diet. Reduce the priority of meat and meals. This does not mean you're, you need to tell your family, hey, we're never having meat again in this house. No, <laughs> that is not going to work. Um, I've read that it's useful for people who have like meat at breakfast, sausage meat, and et cetera. Consider starting with breakfast. If you have three sausage links, cut it down to two, okay? Just like phase it down. Emphasize vegetables, home, and so and in uh, lunch and dinner, vegetables, whole grains, legumes. You can easily include a little poultry or beef. And this is my motto meat as a garnish. So, you know, I might, um, cook up some uh, chicken or whatever and chop it up and put it in the freezer and then pull out a little bit of it. If I want to make something sauteed like this, I might toss in, I don't know, one or two ounces of chicken just to have it in there a little bit. Meat is a garnish. Um, that really works. Um, if, you do, if you like to cook, find a couple of new recipes and start making those. If you don't like to cook, find some easy casseroles with vegetables, grains, and legumes. Again, sort of like this fried rice, it looks like. This is a saute. Um, oh, uh, yeah, uh, high, high protein pasta. I did want to talk about that. Made out of chickpea or lentil flours. This is, um, this is both of these are, I don't know if this is available in, in grocery stores. This is available in grocery stores. There's wheat and it has, um, it has chickpeas and I think lentil flour in there. And um, I recently bought all lentil flour um, pasta. It was delicious. I loved it. And so you put that in there, all of a sudden you got, you know, 15 or, or 20 grams of protein in your stir fry because you've got, a, you've got high protein pasta. So that makes it pretty easy. Um, make a list of foods you want to increase and other foods you want to reduce and then sort of buy accordingly. So just Try, start shifting that balance. Emphasize whole, that means unprocessed foods. Gradually reduce meat and, and mostly beef and lamb um, and processed foods. So here's your, you know, use these as a guidepost. Um, emphasize these, sort of reduce these, really reduce those. So start phasing that stuff out. Phase out the high fat and sugar snacks, phase out the, phase out the soda even if it's diet soda, that's still not that swinging for you. Um, begin introducing, if you have kids, or even if you just like to snack yourself, like I do, um, uh, begin introducing you know, healthy snacks. Now, some of these, I, I laugh, okay? Um, where was the one with the mango? Okay, mango and Greek yogurt. That seems sort of specialized. Like, I don't have mango around the house most of the time. Um, but, hey, celery and peanut butter, yeah. Banana and walnuts, yeah. Apple and almonds, yeah. Carrots and hummus, or just carrots and cottage cheese, or just carrots and something. Um, peaches and cottage cheese. These are sort of not that hard to make happen, but um, uh, they're really good snacks. And um, I have to tell you, I have very zero. I have zero willpower when it comes to cookies and cake, especially if they have chocolate in them. Um, and so a few years ago, I just said, you know what, Sarah, just don't buy it. If I don't have it, I don't eat it. And, you know, I might have a little square of chocolate or whatever. But if I have a bag of chocolate chip cookies, mm, I am toast. So that may help you too. You know, you don't have to have a feeling of privation. You just say, I'm helping myself by not having this in the house. Um, and then try to move away from sugary drinks, even juice. Juice has a lot of sugar in it. And you can make homemade iced tea or whatever. And, and it's not that hard. Just drink water, um, ice water, or whatever. All right, food waste. This is really shocking. Food waste, um, uh, uh, the U.S. wastes 35 to 40% of all the food we grow. Up to 40% of all the food we grow is wasted. So there's this great movie. I'll talk about this later. Just eat it. And in Just Eat It, they say, so this is like dropping 40% of your groceries in the parking lot and just walking away. <laughs> Basically, that's exactly it. Um, uh, $444 billion of food is wasted each year, okay? 
um, it is extra. Some of it is recycled, some of it is donated. Okay, recycled just means uh, um, made into compost, I think. But you know, three hundred ten billion dollars is wasted, even in a country where one out of ten Americans goes hungry routinely. Now, this is a bad picture, right? We have all this excess food, but we have people who are hungry. That isn't right. So I want you to think about this picture also. This is really important because when you waste food, you waste everything it took to grow that food. And so this is from a Natural Resources Defense Council, um, a, a, a report from 2017 called Wasted, appropriately. Um, Every day, 1,250 calories per person is wasted, okay? This is half of the recommended daily intake for adults. But what about all these people who don't have enough food? We're just wasting food, okay? 2.6 um, to 4% of all U.S. greenhouse gas emissions comes from wasted food. This is 37 million passenger vehicles worth. Wasted food used 19, almost 20% of all U.S. cropland, more land than all of New Mexico. It comprises the largest sector of what's in the landfill, 21 to 24% of landfill. Okay, it's the number one contributor by weight, but this, I guess, is this volume. 18% um, of all the fertilizer, remember I talked about how fertilizer produces nitrous oxide, is wasted. It's used on food that is grown that is ultimately wasted, okay? And this is um, wait a minute, this is a million, $218 billion, 1.3% of the U.S. gross domestic product. But bringing it a little closer to home, you didn't personally waste $218 billion, but the average household wastes food worth $1,500. That's a lot. So where does it, where does it get wasted? Some of it's wasted. This is a line that goes from zero to hundred percent. Okay. Some of it's wasted on the farm, about 17%. Um, some of it's wasted in packing and processing. Uh, so here's a woman sorting melons and she tosses all the melons that don't look like they would be sold into the dumpster. $37 billion worth of food. Um, 18 million tons or 20% is wasted in groceries, restaurants, and food service. Well, everybody's seen people busing, you know, the bus guys coming to busing the table with all kinds of food left on the, on the plates. And it's shocking what is found in dumpsters. I mean, packaged food like this in dumpsters, stuff that's in cans and, you know, uh, and dry stuff in dumpsters. So uh, I'll talk about why that is in just a minute. But then, okay, there's your house. 48%, almost half of the wasted food is wasted in our homes, which means we have direct ability to do something about it. Consumers, <coughs> excuse me, also account for waste in other sectors. Because we, when we go to restaurants, we, you know, we, we like buffets. Buffets are a big source of food waste. We like to have big portions and we don't feel bad about just sending, you know, not eating it. Okay. There's not a social stigma about that. But when you go to the grocery store, the food is expected to be perfect. When you go to a restaurant, it's expected to be overabundant. These are expectations that lead to food waste. Okay. What kinds of food are wasted most? Well, perishable items, obviously. Uh, prepared foods and produce, those are sort of the big ones. Um, and a lot of that wastage is doing to, due to overbuying, you know, buy more than you think you can use up or improper storage. That also causes a lot of food waste. Dairy and eggs, there's the sell by date. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, also fresh meat and seafood. And um, where's, uh, oh, I already said dairy and eggs. Yeah, uh, frozen foods, not that much. Dry goods, dry goods get wasted. Um, um, I, I'm not exactly sure why, but um, uh, there's a lot of food waste in our homes. Okay, um, so here's this movie, Just Eat It. I saw this movie uh, not too long ago. It was a real eye opener for me because, you know, I, I'm, I'm aware of food waste and I was thinking about people, you know, scraping their plates off into the trash can and sending it to the dumpster. But I did not realize how much perfectly okay unopened food is wasted. Um, the, the premise of this movie was two filmmakers, I think they happened to be married. They decided to eat only discarded food for six months. So they'd troll around at night to the dumpsters and look in there and pull out food. And, you know, here, these are like um, turkey breasts, not even opened, okay? Um, uh, flats of stuff in jars could not possibly be bad, right? 
Um, but this was the one that really, this is the, the, the man uh, part of the duo. Um, he found this dumpster of hummus, a dumpster, whole dumpster, full of containers of hummus that were three weeks before the sell-by date. So there's like totally nothing wrong with any of that stuff. And they also found a surprising amount of box stuff. You know, box stuff is pretty durable, but it must have been after the sell-by date or something and nobody wanted to buy it, even though it was probably perfectly okay. So this guy works in this um, warehouse for this store called Quest. I think it's in California or someplace. I don't know. But everything in this store was discarded by grocery stores and they round it up and they bring it in and um, people, um, uh, low income people apply to be able to shop at this store. And then they could go, they don't go in this part, but they go out to the actual, looks just like a store and they can buy this perfectly okay food that was discarded. Um, uh, I, I bought a DVD of this movie, but I found yesterday that you can actually access the full length movie on YouTube. So this is the link. You'll get it when you get the slides. Um, wasting some foods costs more than wasting others. Food emits different foods, emit different amounts of greenhouse gases. They use different amounts of water. So here are a bunch of different foods. The down at the bottom are the foods that use more water. And this is um, this is from Dana Gunders. Um, um, book. She's a she's a bit super knowledgeable about food waste. And um, if you look below the line, chocolate. This is each drop is ten minutes in the shower. Okay, so uh, chocolate, you know, uses pretty much water. Chicken uses pretty much water. Cheese, okay, pretty much water. Um, pork, pretty much water. Beef, three hundred and seventy minute shower by wasting one pound of beef. So when you waste beef, whether it's on your plate in a restaurant, you send it, you know, you, you leave it for the bus person or you waste it in your house, you scrape it into the into the trash or whatever, um, you're wasting a lot of water and greenhouse gas emissions. Beef is on the top, lamb, farm prawns. What, what I mean, this is, a, this is from, these guys are British, was published in science, but um, that seemed like a funny thing to put on this thing to me, but anyway, whatever. Pork, cheese, chicken, all the same things that use a lot of water also emit a lot of greenhouse gases. So the amount of wastage in terms of environmental impacts is different depending on the, the food. So keep that in mind as you're going along. What are the best ways to reduce food waste? This is EPA's food recovery hierarchy, and it's really sort of more designed for like, you know, uh, um, uh, municipalities and uh, stores and stuff like that. Um, Dana Gunders came up with this one, which is, you know, match one-to-one -one for home kitchen, kitchens. Best things to do to reduce food waste, worst things to do. The best thing to do is don't buy it, okay? Shop with a list and use restraint. Next, store your food well so it doesn't go off in your refrigerator. And then once you have something in your fridge, cook something with it. Practice emergency, use it up measures or freeze it. I'll talk about these. The dog scores, you can feed some foods to your pet. Um, you can put it in the compost or in the in-sink disposal. Um, but the last and the most worst thing to do for the environment is to put it in the garbage because it goes to the landfill. And when you put organic material like food in the landfill, it decays without air you know, under the uh, the landfill, and that produces a lot of methane. When you compost the food, okay, then it decays with air, and that does not release methane. So composting is much better than garbage. But I want to stress that just because you can compost the food does not give you a license to waste a bunch of food, because there's still a lot of other things you can do to intercept that food you know, like not even buy it before it gets to composting. This is the second to the worst option, okay? Only above putting in the garbage. Barriers to reducing food waste at groceries and restaurants. A lot of this has to do with us and our preferences. Consumers demand low price variety, cosmetic perfection, like, you know, these, these, these look like, you know, the snow white apple of peppers to me. <laughs> uh, 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 how much pesticide had to be put on that to make those, all of this vegetable look so perfect. But the imperfect never made it out of the packing shed or it never made it onto the shelf. Um, and again, we expect a lot 
So we go to a party or we go to a restaurant that has a buffet. We go to some function. There's a lot of food out there. All this lunch meat that was folded and put out there and sit, sits out for two hours or whatever, that should be thrown away, completely wasted. So, um, you know, there's kind of an issue with that. Retailers and restaurants are reluctant to reduce waste if it lowers their sales because it's like, I'm going to take the economic hit and pass on the, the benefit to the, you know, the world at large. Well, most of them are not really willing to do that. Packaging, uh, like plastic packaging like this, you know, plastic may extend shelf life, but in order for a grocery or a, real re a retailer to recycle or compost the food, you have to remove all this plastic. That costs a lot of money because you have to have somebody up, you know, removing the plastic. So that reduces the recycling rate at stores and restaurants. And I, I have to tell you, I was at Safeway a few days ago and I was wandering around the produce area and I saw something I had not seen before, a display of sweet potatoes. Every single sweet potato was wrapped individually in plastic. And I just walked by there and go, you know, I love sweet potatoes, but I would never buy that. And, you know, Safeway just thinks it's great because it's going to reduce the food, um, food loss to spoilage. Um, when uh, retailers and restaurants throw stuff away that they haven't taken the packaging off of, that contaminates the discarded food and that reduces the profitability of recycling and composting. So, you know, then people don't want to do it. But this is something I had not thought of. It doesn't cost very much to throw stuff in the landfill, okay? Very, various municipal charges, I guess, countrywide are not very high. And so it is cheaper to just toss it for the businesses than it is to do what needs to be done to actually get it, you know, cleaned up from its packaging, et cetera. Um, and so there it is in the landfill, you know, uh, and it's gonna be covered up and turn into methane. Okay, why do households waste food? A lot of people are unaware of the problem, but there's, also an important attitude issue. There's no social stigma against wasting food, okay? It's not like, you know, it took a long time, many years to build up a social stigma about littering, but most people don't litter anymore. Um, there's no social stigma against wasting food. So people send it back in the restaurant or put it over to the bus table and don't worry about it. People overbuy, they impulse buy, and they forget about what they bought. Haphazard storage in your house increases spoilage. There's a lot of confusion over date labels. I'll talk about this in the middle in a minute. People don't think about how to use up food or they don't really know how to do it. Um, it's not very hard if you just think about it a little bit. Um, too much food is prepared or served. And there's uh, they talk about this in that movie, Just Eat It. There's um, a, an association between overabundance, having a lot of food on your table and hospitality. So uh, at holiday meals, there's tons and tons of food on the table. And the amount of food wasted over the Thanksgiving weekend is, I think, equal to like one month of other, you know, food wasted just over that one weekend, because people are talking, they leave the food out, it spoils or whatever. And um, yeah, a lot of food gets wasted. Um, leftovers wind up uneaten or not stored properly. So this is the okay way to store them, although I don't like to store in plastic bags anymore. But um, uh, if you don't store your leftovers properly, then, you know, they're not going to be healthful. Okay, so we go to the store and we are bombarded with save this, save that, this is on sale, you know, save 10 cents or whatever, um, buy two for one. And so people buy more stuff and then they forget to use it. And this is so common. So if you can try to resist specials or large sizes, if you don't have an actual plan to use the item. Um, uh, this requires some serious discipline in the store. I, I, I am susceptible to this, I have to tell you, and I have to be really careful about it. Use a shopping list or a grocery list app on your phone. That can really helpful, be helpful. Uh, survey the contents of your fridge. And if you have some stuff that's sort of on the cusp, put it in the eat me first bin. So if somebody goes in there and want to, wants to have lunch, they go in the eat me first and say, okay, what can I make out of this? So that's, a, again, it's an attitude thing. Rotate your stock. When you buy something, put the newer items in the back end of the pantry or the fridge and bring the older items to the front. And occasionally do a pantry inventory. So, you know, know how long stuff is supposed to last. This is a selection of stuff from Costco and I'm not dumping on Costco. Costco is okay. But I don't shop at Costco very much because the 
boxes and containers are so big that I often can't use the stuff up before it goes bad. And, you know, people feel like, oh, I'm going to save a little bit of money. But if you wind up throwing half of it away, you wasted half the money or whatever it is it cost. Okay, store food in a way that will keep it from going bad. And this is the primo food safety law. Don't leave cooked food out for more than two hours. It's a good rule of thumb. Uh, so I had to look this up about, you know, where's the coldest part of the fridge? Bottom and back of the fridge, you know, because the um, on upright fridges like this, you know, fridges, um, you open the doors, the cold air falls out. And so uh, the bottom is the coldest and the back is the coldest because the, the, you know, the front air falls out first, basically. Doors are the warmest. So I read that and I thought, how come my fridge has the two big areas where you can put a gallon of milk on the door? I can't even fit a gallon of milk inside the fridge. Okay. Um, learn how to use the humidity controls on the crispers. I was completely unaware of this. High, they have a little things you can move along. Um, high humidity is for like lettuce produce that wilts, low humidity for ripe fruit. So if you do this, this stuff will last longer. Be careful to separate the raw meat from the other stuff. Like sometimes packages of raw meat like drip and stuff. That's just bacteria waiting to happen on all your other food. And that's going to make you sick. And then keep the doors closed. Tell your kids, do not stand in front of the refrigerator. I mean, I tell myself, don't stand in front of the refrigerator. You know what's in there. Just open the door and get it. Okay. Now, should I throw this out? What do those dates mean? This is one of the most annoying things ever. There is no federal, no set of federal regulations requiring dates uh, to mean a specific thing or specifying language. Um, there are all these dates, these are the USDA dates, sell by date. This is how long the store should display the product to manage their inventory, not a safety date. Okay. Um, in fact, a lot of people think this should be in code so the consumer can't even see it. Sell by date. Best buy or best if used by. That is when a product has the best flavor or quality, not a safety date, nothing to do with safety. Use by the last date recommended for peak quality, not a safety date except infant formula. That's the only thing where used by means anything. Freeze by, ditto, when to freeze to maintain peak quality. Not a safety date. So refed, this is now the big you know, nonprofit that is very good on food waste, recommends two dates, one for quality, one for safety. Best if used by for quality, used by for safety. I don't even think we need this. Just, you know, if you have to have a date, put, just put that one on. Okay, so those are the dates. They don't mean anything. So how are you going to tell when the food is bad? I looked up on the USDA website. How do you tell when food is bad? You know, do you use the date? The USDA advice on when to throw food out is this. I, I looked this up last year. If it is past the date, a product should still be safe and wholesome if handled properly until the time spoilage is evident. <coughs> In other words, the date means nothing to you. Spoiled food will develop an off odor, flavor, or texture. If it has, don't eat it. Well, duh, this is what people were using in the 1940s to decide whether food was safe to eat. Does it smell bad? If it does, don't eat it. Does your meat smell bad or look slimy? Don't eat it. It's the wrong color, don't eat it. Do you have a canned food that's rust? I mean, I don't know where they found this can, the bottom of a creek somewhere, but rusted, leaking, or bulging. If you ever see a bulging can, that means there's bacteria inside and the, um, the uh, CO2 from the bacteria has pushed up the lid. So you don't want to, you don't want to eat that. Canned food, if there's bubbling in the jar, bulging lids, visible seepage, odd color, smell, film, slime, or mold, or rusted can. This is like stuff everybody knows, right? And has known for decades. We do not need those deets. This is what you should use to decide if the food is worth eating or not. Okay. Um, I'm not going to talk about this in detail because you'll have all this on your slides, but <laughs> there's, um, some hard and fast rules to um, keep food safe because a lot of people get sick from bad food safety ha uh, practices. Okay, how to be sure food gets used. The more different things you cook for dinner every week, the more chance that there is that you're going to waste something. Okay, so uh, it saves a lot of time and it saves a lot of food waste if you make a lot, like make a casserole. And then, you know, plan to eat the leftovers or repurpose them into something else or freeze them. Watch the serving size. Don't put too much food on the plate because once it's on the plate, it's really hard to say, okay, Johnny, you know, you've got food on your plate. I'm going to put it in a little Tupperware for you in the fridge. You need to eat that. 
say, if you're hungry, go back, you can go back and get some more, but don't put more on your plate than you're planning to eat. Um, prep for, so this, I think a lot of people think if the plate doesn't have enough food on it, it's, it looks stingy, but it's a food waste thing. Prep for several meals and then freeze in either portion sizes or meal sizes. And you can do that before you cook or after you cook. And then this is kind of a hint for, for perishables like onions and celery and, and fruit. You can just freeze them and then, you know, use as needed. So I have a bag of cut up frozen onions and peppers in my freezer and I pull it out and bust off a little piece and toss it in the pan if I want to cook something. And you always will have, if you have this, you always have something, some way to rescue food. You can turn it into a soup or something. Rescue food before it spoils. Make something out of it. Have a few recipes up your sleeve for using stuff up that sometimes goes bad. And you can combine with items you have in your freezer to make a soup, a stir fry, rice, whatever. Freeze it, freeze it. This is hard if you don't have a chest freezer. I will grant you, okay? It, and if you have a regular refrigerator freezer, it's very hard to be able to use this to its maximum advantage. But, um, you know, you can freeze fruit, milk, butter, eggs. I mean, partial jars of stuff. I do that all the time. Um, uh, you can share it, you know, have your neighbors over and cook something up, feed it to a pet. So there's lots of things you can do that will actually use the food before we go to the composter. So the last chance before composting, rescue food by feeding it to your pet. Now you have to be careful. <laughs> No more than 5% of your diet to the diet of your pet should be scraps or food, you know, not off the table, but, you know, food that you, you are wanting to get rid of. You have to be aware of, uh, beware of leftovers because, you know, you don't want your dog to have a lot of spicy stuff or sugary stuff, a lot of oil or whatever, spicy or saucy foods. Um, and so you have to be careful about that. If you have meat in chunks, you can rinse it off to get it back to sort of the natural, I mean, it'll be cooked, but the not spiced up condition, then that's not too bad. But this is from the... Um, ASPCA, uh, foods that are hazardous to dogs. So, you know, here's stuff you don't want to feed your, your dog. Everybody has a dog knows this. You don't feed them chocolate. You don't feed cooked chicken bones, right? Um, or, uh, but all this stuff is okay. So that helps. Now, um, this is just about the last slide. If you're curious about how much your family weighs and you really want to spend a little time, there's two ways of doing it. One, you can take everything you waste at obviously you have to take off the packaging and put it in a baggie. And then at the end of the week, weigh it. Okay. And, you know, you make a note of what you, what, what was wasted. Or if you're really a data person, you can get a food waste log like this. And if you put something into the compost, what was it? How much was it? Why did you waste it? What did it cost you? And then at the end of the week, you might find, wow, I just composted 50 bucks worth of food. And, you know, maybe that would make you feel like before you put it in the compost, you're not putting it in the trash anymore, right? Before you put it in the compost, um, you know, think about it. Next time, I'm not going to waste that, okay? Good intentions. I'm with you. You know, it's really hard to do stuff. If you have kids, if you have a job, if you have kids and a job, you know, it's everything takes time. I understand that. Okay, here's my conclusions. As with many things, attitude is everything. And, you know, first start out giving yourself a break, do your health and do the environment a favor by reducing meat, especially beef and cured meat. This is a picture from the movie, Just Eat It, um, from a period of time, one of the world wars, when there was just a lot of public sentiment for the common good, okay? Food will win the war. Don't waste it. Use less wheat and meat, buy local food, serve just enough, use what's left, okay? Pitch in, help the common good. Well, we are in a problem right now where we really need some help, you know, <laughs> where it would be really great if everyone pitched in and did what they could, especially on these things that have a big impact. Um, it's very hard in our country right now to, to um, imagine that. Um, because I think people have a different conception of the common good. But um, I like to think that there are a lot of people who want to help. What's the easiest way to save money on food? People are worried about inflation. People are worried about how much food costs. Easy way to save money. Make two decisions. One, don't buy it if you don't really don't think you're going to eat it. Or if you're really not sure you're going to eat it, just don't buy it. 
Once it's in the house, don't waste it. Those two things are going to save you a boatload of money. Um, then again, back to attitude. Have an open, curious, I want to learn about it attitude. That's always a good way to go through life. Um, because a lot of stuff you think might be boring is actually not boring. Um, and you can learn a few new things. It's really reward. You all know that. You all, I mean, anybody on this webinar after an hour and 10 minutes is already a lifelong learner. So you you already know how great it is to learn things. Enlist family or a friend, you know, have to have a, somebody to help you with this. Try making a list and just try to recognize impulse buying. There you are in Costco. Here's this gigantic container of something. Well, you like that something, but you know, you realize when you look at that gigantic container, you haven't eaten that much of that thing ever. So don't buy it. Um, save, save time by making a lot, eating leftovers. Try a few easy recipes for plant-based foods. You know, just start slow, okay? Try freezing a few things, et cetera. Then give yourself a pat on the back. Celebrate your progress. You're doing a good thing. You're helping You're helping yourself. You're helping your family. You're helping the, the uh, sort of planet at large, the human species at large. It's a good thing. Okay, I can take some questions.